Thank you so much, Cliff. I mean, there's so many people to thank uh, in this, and we'll have time for that later, but I just I really appreciate Cliff a lot. I like, appreciate you uh, leading with that uh, this morning. Um, and I know there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things to be excited about in this campaign. I know one of the things that many of you have shared with me is retiring some of that debt uh, that you know, we've, we've had in the last several years. And just, just one reality here is that debt has actually helped us get to where we are now. It really is. I mean, it's made this building possible. It's made so many other things uh, possible uh, to get to where we are now. Paying off that debt is going to help us get to where we want to go. And I know you're excited about that because that's just such a good feeling of, of freedom, really. And I don't, I don't know about you, but I remember back when I was about 16 years old and feeling that first real feeling of independence and freedom. You know, I was driving alone. Uh, in my 1994 baby blue Chrysler minivan. <laughs> and I'm telling you, the world was full of possibilities. It was. I mean, I, I remember thinking, I can go anywhere. If I want to go to the beach, I can physically get there. I have an atlas in my, you know, side of my car. I can pull it up. I can figure out how to get there. I can go anywhere. I mean, I can drive across town. I can go anywhere that I want to. I, I mean, I have freedom. But then there's a realization, if you're, you're kind of like 15, 16, 17 years old, you know this, is that you realize if you go anywhere, you're going to need money. And I, I realized I need money. I need a job, you know. But then there was a, a follow-up realization, which is if I go anywhere with my money, what little that I had, and I spend that money on one thing, I'm saying no to so many other things. Seriously, if you're 15, 16 right now, I mean, maybe you've already figured this out, but if you put money here, it, and you can't put money here too, right? I mean, it, there's a finite amount. If you put money here, you can't put money here and here and here and here. You kind of have to choose. And this is a, a concept that's called opportunity cost. If you don't know it yet, maybe you already know it. But if you don't know it yet, I just wanted to tell you what it is right up front. Opportunity cost is this. Opportunity cost is missing out on B because you chose A. You know, you miss out on B because you chose A, and you ranked your priorities, and Paul talked about priorities last week. You're missing out on B because you chose A, and it's really hard. The way my dad described this uh, growing up, my sister and I had, a, you know, kind of a tendency to overextend, uh, overextend ourselves with money or with time. He'd say, hey, hey, life is a buffet. Life is a buffet, and you, you get a plate. And you can only put so much on that plate, so choose wisely what you put on that plate. Now, me, I heard that, and I was like, great, I love buffets. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, I do, especially all-you-can-eat buffets. My parents used to joke that if I went to an all-you-can-eat all buffet, after a little while, the owners of the restaurant would come out, and they would say, Houston, that is all you can eat. You know, <laughs> you, you need to leave. I love buffets because I have this, like, fear of missing out. You know, and it's that fear of missing out on whatever B is even when you prioritize A, it's that fear that led me to a transition in my life from I need money to I want money. Well, this is such a delicate transition. And seriously, every, everybody goes through this at some point from I need money to I want money. Because my thinking was is I want money because I want to have to say no to as few things as possible. I don't want to have to miss out I know I need money, but I want money because I want to say yes to more things, right? And for all of us, all of us, money means that needs are met and that wants are met, right? That needs are met and that wants are met. So we all want money. And ladies, I, I'm, this is just my experience. I don't know if this is true for all of you, and maybe it's true for some of you men, but ladies, what money means for a lady, for a woman, is security. You know, that, that my needs and that my wants are going to be met from now, not just today, not just tomorrow, but like indefinitely into the future. And for men, so often money means, and this is true for some of the ladies too, money means accomplishment, right? We sometimes treat money like a scoreboard, you know? The more money that I have, you know, the more successful I am and the more greater my status is, the greater my value is. And so we treat money kind of as a, as a scoreboard of even just evaluating our own self-worth. Money means you know, needs are met, wants are met, and then we have security, and we have accomplishment, and we're moving forward in life. I think Solomon, actually, or whoever the teacher was representing the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes got this. When he somewhat sarcastically said, a feast 
It was made for laughter. Wine makes life merry, and money is the answer for everything. You, know, you want to party, you want to enjoy life, you want not just your needs met, but you actually want to enjoy things, you got to have money. Which leads us to a survival instinct that's really within all of us. And this survival instinct with the realization that we need money and the realization that we want money so we can say yes to the things we want to say yes to, the survival instinct is this. You know, do I have enough? Do I have enough for my needs to be met and for my wants to be met? Do I have enough? And we think through this in different stages of our life, in different periods where maybe money's flowing, maybe money's not flowing, but we think, you know, do I have enough to to make ends meet? I'm aware of some of you here, you know, you've shared with me in, in confidence, like, hey, we're just having a hard time making ends meet right now. You know, we're not really even thinking about all of our other wants that we used to be able to say yes to. We just want to we really want to keep, you know, the bills paid. We want to keep the lights on. We want to make sure that the car is running so I can get to work. We want to make sure the car is running so we can go to that job interview that's going to help us get back on track. And do I have enough to make ends meet? Some of you are, you know, thinking, do I have enough to maintain my lifestyle and cover large future expenses, right? I mean, we're living good now, but we know we've got several other large expenses coming up. I had a friend text me recently after thinking about, you know, kids and college and just thinking about how expensive college can be these days. I was like, oh man, like how are we going to, you know, cover that? What's your plan for covering college and stuff like that? And, you know, we joked about some uh, possible scenarios, but really what came back to me, I was like, you know, I'm not concerned about college yet. Like my kids, I'm just concerned about braces, you know, like <laughs> braces are coming up. <laughs> and, you know, I'm concerned, you know, how am I going to buy their minivans so they can be cool like I was in high school? <laughs> You know, and you think about cars, you think about all these other things that you, you've got to cover. You know, we're trying to maintain this lifestyle, we enjoy this lifestyle. How are we going to cover some of those other things? And still others think, you know, do I have enough to live like they do? You know, I, I really want to live like they do. I love the way that they live. I want to travel the way they travel. I want to vacation the way they vacation. You know, do I have enough to do that? Sometimes we don't ask this question. We just try to live like they do. And that gets us into a lot of trouble. And yet the desire is still there. You know, do I have enough? You know, and then there's others. Do I have enough to live the life we've always wanted to live? You know, maybe we've said no to travel now or no to vacations, but our kids get a little bit older, you know, we get them through college or get them kind of well on their way. We want to travel. We want to go see the world. You know, are we going to have enough to do that? You know, or maybe... We're going to have enough to get that second home, you know. We just don't want a big home, but we want that second home that all the kids and the grandkids can come and develop relationships with each other and really develop the kind of relationships that will exist long after we're gone. You know, we want that for them, and that's uh, such a great way to be able to to do that if, if you're able to. Or when we are gone, do I have enough to leave the kind of inheritance that, you know, they would be able to thrive and, you know, be successful and, like, be able to pursue some of the things they want to pursue. And these are all things. These are all things that we think through. We, do I have enough? And regardless of where you are in this, we're trying to make ends meet or preparing for the future, we all really want one thing, right? We all want financial independence. Isn't our whole system designed around that? Don't we just work and work and work and try to figure out ways and we invest and we save and you know, we plan because we're trying to get financial independence. So one day, you know, one day, you know, I can work if I want to, but I don't have to because I'm financially independent. I don't need to live like a king, you know. I don't need to have everything that I want. I just want financial independence. I don't even need to live like they do. I just want to live like I do with financial independence. And I, then I can just kind of breathe a sigh of relief because I have enough. The reality is you may not want to live like a king. Maybe you don't have financial independence yet, but most of us already live richer than kings. And, and here's, here's what I mean. I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty in this. This is just kind of a reality. This is just kind of where we are in history right now. This is what I mean. Richer than kings. Okay, when you think about the kind of way that a king would live or the standard of living that a king would enjoy. I mean, some kings, they enjoy certain perks, right? I mean, they're the king, so they get to kind of tell people what to do and kind of enjoy some things that the rest, rest of us might not get to. And one thing that comes to mind, if, if you're a king, is servants prepare your food, right? 
I mean, if, if you're a king and you don't have servants to prepare your food, you're not really a king. I mean, you know, you may have a lot of money, but like if you don't have servants preparing your food, well, here's the thing. I say this just somewhat tongue in cheek, but we already have that. And I know some of you are sitting there thinking, like, well, I don't go out to eat, you know, I'm, you know, I make food. Well, you go to a store where people prepare your food, and you go buy that prepared food, and you bring that home. Like, no, no, I'm from scratch the whole way. I go, okay, well, you go get the ingredients, and you put it in your Instant Pot, and three minutes later, you have a roast and potatoes and carrots. Like, all I'm saying is, is servants really prepare your food. That's just kind of where we are in life, or at least in America right now. Think about another thing that a king would enjoy, another perk that a king would enjoy. Servants bring you the things you want, you know? I mean, if you want something, you don't have to go get it. You know, someone else brings it to you. And really, we have that. <laughs> we have that, don't we? I mean, now you don't even have to go tell somebody. You just kind of like push a button, and it's there within a reasonable amount of time. You know, a third thing, and seriously, I just, I just want to make sure you understand this point. Nearly everything that you have is the best thing. When you think about what money can buy you, when you look at just kind of the world and the possibilities of what you can buy with money, almost everything that you have, many of you, I know the same is true for me, that you have is the best thing. And everybody's got their standard of living, right? Their standard of luxury, what luxury is. Do you know what this is? I know what this is. This is a tankless hot water heater. Now, you've got your standard of living, uh, your standard of luxury. This is mine, Right? Like water that never runs out. I mean, think about this. Not even Solomon, in all his splendor, had one of these. <laughs> I mean, it is amazing to think about. This is where we are. You can set it to the temperature that you want, and it just never runs out. It's amazing. And we all enjoy some of these luxuries, don't we? I love the way that um, Don Boudreaux, who is an um, economist, is a professor at, at George Mason University. He wrote an article a few years ago I just thought it was super interesting, and it kind of took this point that I was making a little bit further. And the uh, professor said this, and this was kind of the, the, uh, the title of the article, which I think really says it all. Most ordinary Americans in 2016 are richer then was John D. Rockefeller in 1916. Okay, you with me? 2016, 1916. And if you don't know who John D. Rockefeller was, he was one of, if not the first, billionaire. Now, I know many of you are not billionaires out there. If you were, well, I mean, our goals for this campaign would be a lot different. <laughs> but the standard of living that you could have enjoyed as a billionaire back in 1916 was way lower than you not as a billionaire today, and far from it today in 2016. You just enjoy such a higher uh, standard of living than he did 100 years ago. Just 100 years ago. Isn't that crazy? I mean, would you want to trade places with him? And that's what this article is all about. Would you really want to trade places with him being a billionaire 100 years ago versus what you get to enjoy now? I mean, even if you had multiple homes, let's say you had one in New York and one in L.A., I mean, just to travel from one to the other would take you multiple days on a train that was uncomfortable and probably didn't have, like, heating and air on it. So it was also unsafe. And so, I mean, we just think about some of the things that he could enjoy back then. Maybe you think, oh, maybe I would have liked that. I could have had multiple homes. I could have just really, I would have had enough. But your standard of living is so much higher now. And even in spite of that, we still have this, this survival instinct that often becomes an anxiety of, do I have enough? And I know some of you are sitting there thinking, like, I know, I already know I don't have enough. Your question is more, will I have enough? So my question for you, how much is enough? How much is enough? And see, here's the problem with this question, is we don't really know. When you think about this, how much is enough, you're thinking about what you need for today and tomorrow and for the next multiple years in, a, in advance. And you, you can try to think about what all your needs will be, but you don't know what all your wants are going to be. I mean, there's some things that haven't even been invented yet, and you're going to want the latest version of it. How much is enough? By whatever definition we use for enough, will we ever have enough? And... I know some of you are sitting there, probably if our roles were reversed, you're sitting there thinking what I would be thinking if our roles were reversed. Look, I'm not greedy. I see where you're going with this. I'm not greedy. I'm not even like those Christians who just sing about like, okay, I'm fine now, God, but when I get to heaven, I want a mansion and I want a robe 
and a crown, and I just want to be able to walk around like that. Like, like what? what? What do you want that for? Like, I'm not greedy, but life is expensive. And even death isn't free. I, I'm not greedy, but life is expensive. I just want enough for the anxiety to go away. I just want enough to kind of be able to come home and take a deep breath and just say, oh, I have enough. I'm not greedy. I just want enough to be happy. I just want enough for my children to be happy. I just want enough for my grandchildren to be happy. I just want enough to be happy. Really, is that too much to ask for? Well, the good news is, is that we're not the first to struggle with this. In fact, Jesus addressed this very tension one day when a man came to him to ask Jesus to settle a dispute between he and his brother over the inheritance their father had left them. Maybe you know that story. This story was thankfully recorded in our Christian Bible, what we often call our New Testament, uh, by a very scholarly doctor named Luke. And Luke had thoroughly investigated Jesus' life, including his death and resurrection. And he had recorded the conversation that Jesus had with this man who asked him to settle this dispute. Now, this wasn't one of those conversations where, you know, it was just kind of off to the side as Jesus was like going in, you know, to the temple or as he was on his way from one place to the next and someone kind of came up and said, hey, my brother's kind of like ripping me off here. Can you help me out? This was one of those times that Luke tells us, this is in Luke chapter 12. This is one of those times that Luke says that many thousands of people had gathered. This is just so cool. I mean, Jesus was so attractive. The people came from all over to hear him, to be around him, to be near him. This was one of those times that Luke says many thousands of people had gathered. And so you can only imagine how this man had had to push his way through the crowd, probably dragging his brother by the ear all the way up to Jesus. And this is what he says. This is what the man says to Jesus. He says, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. You know, and it just kind of gets quiet. Like, everybody's just kind of quiet. Jesus had been teaching, and then this guy comes up and makes this, like, request, almost demand of Jesus, and it just kind of gets quiet. And Jesus replies, and he says, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Yeah, who am I? Why are you coming to me? And we don't really know why the man came to Jesus. Maybe he thought, you know, I've been trying to work on my brother for a long time and he's not listening to me. I mean, this is kind of getting ridiculous. Dad passed away a few years ago and he's still not sharing it with me. And, you know, I just think maybe Jesus, you got so much influence, you know, maybe if you told him, maybe he would listen. Or maybe he thought, hey, this is such a great opportunity. There's thousands of people here. And I'm going to go say in front of all of them how my brother, who has a responsibility to, to share the inheritance with me, how he's not been sharing that and hold him accountable. And basically, he's been ripping me off. And hey, everybody, you want to do business with this guy? I don't think so. We don't know what the reasons were, but Jesus doesn't even address it. In fact, he takes it a different direction almost completely. And he addresses the underlying issue there. This is what Jesus says. He says, Then he said to them, to the crowd and to the brothers, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And then Jesus tells them this parable, which I'm sure many of you are very, very familiar with. But I'd like you to just take a minute and just try to look at it with new eyes and look at it in this context. Then Jesus says, The ground of a certain rich man which we don't know who the rich man is until the end of the parable. But he says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, oh, what am I going to do? I, I have to have a place, I don't have no place to store my crops. You know, he's trying to think, and this is what a great problem, right? Wouldn't we all like this problem? Everybody would like this problem. Because of that anxiety of do I have enough, we would all love the opportunity to say, I don't know what I'm going to do with all of this. But then he says to himself, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones and there I'll store, store my surplus grain. And he has kind of this self-talk here. He's kind of like reminding himself, feeling maybe that anxiety that we have about do I have enough? This is, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear these down. I'm going to build a bigger one. There I'll store my surplus grain. And then he says to himself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. It's almost as if he's reminding himself, hey man, when you start to get stressed about having enough, just remember, you've got plenty of grain stored up for many years. It's kind of like, okay, 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 yeah, when that anxiety creeps up, you've got plenty of grain, man, take it easy. In fact, that's what he says. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. 
You don't have to worry anymore. Your whole life you spent worrying about whether you're going to have enough. Now you have enough. Take it easy. But then God responds. He says, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. And what's God saying or what's Jesus saying through, through God right here? He's saying, even all that stuff that you stored up, you're not going to get to enjoy it. All that you got in your greed or everything that you get in your greed isn't guaranteed. It's not guaranteed that you're actually going to be able to enjoy it. You fool. What were you thinking? What were you thinking? You, you're not even going to get to enjoy it. And worse, this is when we find out who that certain man was. This is what he says. You fool, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? And that's when all eyes in the crowd kind of slowly turn to the brothers who are standing there. And the realization of, of what Jesus' point is this. Oh, these two brothers... These two brothers are who are going to inherit are who are going to inherit all that was stored up. And what are they going to do with it? They're just going to argue over it. And this is the point. Not only will you not even get to enjoy what you stored up because life is a vapor and it's so very short, but you will be setting up your children and everyone else that you have influence with for relational failure. Because they're going to try to look at your example and do the same thing. They're going to be arguing over that inheritance because, you know, they're also stressed out about, do I have enough? And Jesus says, maybe smiling at the brothers, this, this, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. These two brothers can't stand each other because they're arguing over the inheritance. This is how it will be. What Jesus says next is often in sermons and messages and teachings, often separated from this parable. I just think Jesus really wanted the two to go together. And I think you know it so well, I'm not going to put it on the screen. Because Jesus addresses some of the, you know, first century problems that they had. And really, they're pretty similar to our problems today, which is, you know, he says, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear. I mean, don't worry about all those earthly stuff. I mean, the world, you know, pagans, people who are unbelievable, that's what they do. I'm calling you to something so much more. And Jesus addresses in this. He's saying, seek first the kingdom of heaven. Oh, you'll get all these other things. And what he's addressing is really, really it's a demand that we all have before we're willing to take that step of faith. And it's something that maybe you're not a Christian yet and you're wondering if you're going to take that step of faith. And Jesus addresses maybe your demand or your question right up front too. Or maybe you've been a Christian for a long time and you just need this reminder to be able to continue in your faith. You've gotten stagnant in your faith. This is, this is really kind of how the demand goes. If I really follow Jesus, I really need to know that I really will be taken care of. If I really follow Jesus, I really need to know that I really will have a better life. If I'm going to deny myself and I'm going to take that step to follow Jesus, I really need to know that it's going to be better. And Jesus says, kind of like a shepherd talking to a sheep, he says, do not be afraid, little flock. Your father's been pleased to give you the kingdom. He's been pleased to give you something so much more than what you even imagined. A higher way of living where you no longer have to worry about all this stuff, that's going to be taken care of. Take a step with me. Enjoy what eternal life is going to be like, but enjoy that now. You get to begin enjoying eternal life now when you take a step and you, you actually enter the kingdom. And those who are sitting there, well, Jesus, how do you do that? And he gives us the starting point right here. You, you want the kingdom? Sell your possessions and give to those in need. Make purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail. Where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. And then Jesus says something I, I'm sure you're all familiar with. this. Maybe you know this so well. He says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And this is so brilliant. Essentially, what he's saying is, is you know, what you give your money to or what, how you use your money, that shows you what you actually care about the most. Or 
What you do with your money reveals what you value most. This is so cool because it doesn't matter what you say or what you say you believe or really even what you believe. If you want to know what you care about the most, follow the money. Follow the cash. Follow the credit. Like, actually look at your bank statement and say, like, what do I care about most? Oh, well, here it is. I, this is what I care about most. This is where my heart is because that's how I'm using my money. It's so brilliant. And now this isn't really just like a, a Christian thing. This is just like a thing thing, right? I mean, this is just a true thing. So if you're not a Christian and you're like, oh, that's just something Jesus said. No, no, no. This applies to everybody. What you do with your money reveals what you value most. Now, if you're not a Christian, then what I'm about to spend the next few minutes talking about doesn't necessarily apply to you, though you're invited into that. In fact, if, if you actually take that step, you'll actually experience something, maybe something you've never experienced before, and it's really so great. And while we're on the topic of the word Christian, I love the word Christian. I mean, I, I am a Christian. I've always said that I'm a Christian. I, I believe that's true because being a Christian is so associated with what you believe, and that's a big part of it. I mean, believing that Jesus was the Son of God and believing that, you know, he died and that he was resurrected and he came back to life, I mean, that's such a big part of it. And often, when we use the word Christian, that's what we're meaning. But around here, we often use the word uh, disciple, we use the word disciple. In fact, I think Jesus probably preferred the, at least our understanding of the meaning behind this word, maybe even a little bit more, because he said, he said, follow me. He didn't say, believe in me. He said, follow me. He, he said, don't just watch what I'm doing. Do what I'm doing. Go where I'm going. Serve the way I'm serving. Give the way that I am giving. Here, here's the reality. You can't really call yourself a disciple. You're not really a disciple. You can't really call yourself a disciple unless you're supporting the work that Jesus is doing in the world. Unless you're giving the way that Jesus gave. Another way of saying this, you're not really submitted to his lordship unless you're giving to support the things that, that he wants supported. He's not really your king unless you are supporting his work. Here's his invitation. If you want the kingdom, if you want to be my king, if you want the anxiety about having enough to go away, if you want to be a follower, not just a believer, if you want the kingdom, then give away what you can't take with you anyway. What you wouldn't want to take with you anyway. Because the kingdom is so much better. Now here, listen, 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 this is, so, this is so important. There are really two levels of giving, okay? Giving is so central to what it means to be a disciple, but there's really two levels of giving. The first level is what I would call spontaneous giving, and spontaneous giving is really so good because it's realizing what somebody needs and you fill that need. In fact, you gain a lot of purpose in that. It's sometimes emotional, and it's almost always measurable. You hear about a need, you give to support that need, boom, you had purpose in filling that need. And we do that almost every year. I mean, I can think of a couple examples. The last few years have been hurricanes in Florida, Puerto Rico, and we've heard about some of the needs. And, you know, in like 20 minutes, we've raised $40,000, and we send that $40,000 down there to the people who can use it, and they meet those needs, and boom, it's like, wow, we did it. And it feels great because it's emotional, it's exciting, it's measurable, and you're like, yes, I, I was part of that. But Jesus actually calls us to something more than that. Because this isn't just, you know, this isn't just a discipleship thing. Spontaneous giving isn't just a discipleship thing. This isn't just a Christian thing. Spontaneous giving, this is just like a humanitarian thing. This is like, you know, a warm-blooded, like, human thing. When you see someone in need, you meet their needs. It's like an American thing. Jesus calls us to something so much more. In fact, in that whole dialogue that we looked earlier in Luke chapter 12, Jesus continues his, his message on to those who are listening, following the prompt of the man who asked to settle this dispute between he and his brother. And he kind of concludes that whole message with this and something that just, it really just drives me and I think it will you as well. Jesus says, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, 
much more will be asked. In fact, I would encourage you to go back and read what Jesus says kind of prior to that, and I think it will fuel you as well. And it fuels me to not just be, you know, a spontaneous giver, but to take a step, a next level step, into becoming a visionary giver. Now, I know you're sitting there thinking, like, visionary giver, that sounds like too big. I'm not much of a visionary. Here's what I mean by that. A visionary giver is someone who looks into the future and they they realize the needs that are going to come up before they even come up. Right? You with me? Spontaneous giving is when you see a need and you meet that need. Visionary giving is when you look forward and you say, I'm going to give because I know there's going to be needs that are going to come up. I know because of my own experience and those of those around me, there are going to be needs that come up in marriages and relationships with, you know, fathers and sons and mothers and daughters. And I'm going to give because I want to make sure the resources are there when those problems come up. In fact, I want to be part of something that gets organized around that giving. In fact, if we all started giving, you know, visionary giving is when multiple people join and they kind of make this partnership, right? And you go from not just having purpose in giving, but you become a partner in the mission in giving. Are you with me? This is like regular giving. This is like percentage giving. This is like, you know, right off the top, you know, I get my paycheck right off the top. I'm giving because I can see into the future enough to know that people are going to have the same problems that I have. And I want to be part of a church and I want to be part of an organization that gets together and creates environments and creates, you know, ministries and does things to meet the needs that haven't even come up yet. And that's why visionary giving is level two giving. It's so much better than level one. Now, let's make this a little bit personal. Do you know the percentage of people here at Grace Chapel that would fall into this category of visionary giving, just like regular, it's like percentage giving, it's just, this is, you know, I'm committed to this because I'm a partner with this church, and I, like, I really want to make sure that this church is successful. You know what percentage that is? It's 34%. Now, I know we've got a lot of spontaneous givers in here, And quite honestly, I don't even know who the 34% is, and I don't know who the other 66% is. And we take a lot of, you know, links here, and we kind of bend over backwards to make sure that we don't really even know, like, who's doing what. Because we just believe that's between you and the Lord. But if I can, I want to talk to the 66 for a minute and say this. Every disciple of Jesus needs a plan for how they're going to support his work in the world. Every disciple needs a plan for how you're going to support his work. Now, I know you're sitting there and you're probably thinking, yeah, okay, I know you're saying this. I mean, they probably pay you to say this because the church needs money, right? Right, I mean, that's kind of your job to get up there and tell us why we should give more because the church needs money. Here's, here's something. The church does not need your money. Now, you know, now hang on, you know that God doesn't need your money. All powerful, created everything. He doesn't need your money. He can make it happen. But did you know that the church doesn't need your money either? Those of you who are part of the 66, the church doesn't need your money. Do you know why? Because there are 34% people who, that's just what they do. And they're making it happen every single week and every single event and every single environment, every single youth retreat and everything. They're making it happen. The 34% are helping us maintain everything. You, if you were to join them, would help us go further faster. We need your money because we want to go further faster. And when you take that step and you actually go from level one to level two, you help us go further faster. So here's what I'm asking this morning. It's just this. Will you level up? Will will you level up? Will you make a plan to become a visionary giver? Will you actually take that step and say, I want to be, not just have purpose in giving, I want to be a partner in giving. I want to be part of this every single week, every single month, every single quarter, every single year because I so believe in what my church is doing. And do you know what happens? Do you know what happens really when you do that? When you do that and you become a visionary giver and you pray these words, your kingdom come. You're putting your money where your mouth is. You're taking that next step to say, Lord, I want your kingdom to come so bad, I'm willing to give you all of my resources to do this. And so I'm inviting you to take that next step. And I know some of you are sitting here, oh, we've, we've wanted to do that for a long time and, you know, we've really been playing on it, but it's just, you know, the timing hasn't been great. The timing is never going to be great to take that step. And here's an opportunity for you. 
here's an opportunity for you. We're in this campaign. This is a room to grow campaign, right? We've talked about some of the things we're doing in this. This is an opportunity to give a gift that will keep on giving long after you. Not only in paying down our debt are we going to free up money every single month that's going towards principal and interest on our mortgage that's going to go now back fully into ministry and mission work and planting churches, but you're also building some facilities and you're part of building some facilities that will create environments where people will get to know Jesus maybe for the first time or will help them take a next step in their faith. And just think about that. I mean, you think about just this that we have now that's been created, you know, by you. You've made this possible. Think about how, from now until Jesus comes back again, how these environments are going to help fuel faith in the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation. So here's the deal. I, I want you to level up. I'm encouraging you to level up. Come up with a plan, whether it's $10 a month or 10% of your income. It doesn't matter. Level up. Be part of the mission be part of helping us go further, faster. But if you don't, if you decide not to, I can assure you that the leaders of this church will still be here for you. And they'll be ready to meet your needs. You know why? Because they love it. And because someone did that for them one time. And it made all the difference in their life. I hope that you'll enjoy that one day yourself. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for Jesus and his sacrifice and that you didn't give us just 10% of him, but you gave us all of him. I pray that we'll respond in faith and that we will really become visionary givers and that we'll catch the vision that you have for this church and really for your church at large and that we'll advance the kingdom so more can experience the benefits of eternal life, not just in the age to come, but today. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.